All right, thank you. I'm going to talk about third parties and rail. Um, so I hope you will enjoy my presentation and I hope um, you have uh, questions and uh, later during the week we can have some brainstorming about um, some of the open questions that are part of this presentation. So let's get started. So when you have this rail performance user model, obviously um, as someone makes a website, you want to try your best to actually hit it, right? Um, so again, what what is the real performance model? Um, it's very simple. It's a set of budgets for different state of the user experience. So for response, you should respond to user interaction under 100 millisecond. Animation should happen at 60 frames per second. Um, idleness is it's basically a way to get to the responsiveness part of the rail. So you should chunk your work into 50 millisecond pieces or less. And finally, loading is one second. Uh, you should have something useful, at least meaningful, on the screen in under one second. And the expectation is that when you reach that stage, um, your website, your app should be uh, in a useful state. So this is like not that difficult, right? Um, you just take what you have and turn it into a super fast thing, right? And I mean, this is not complicated because we have all those uh, fancy technologies like Service Worker, Script Async, Fast Web Tactics, uh, WebP, WebM, Web to Web Fonts, Font Loading API, CSS Animation, and the list goes on and on and on, right? Except uh, you, you could say, sure, it's a lot of work, but the, the main difficulty is not that. Like you can, if you, if you put some effort, you can actually make your thing awesome, except that this model is wrong. This is not what your current website is. Uh, what you have actually is something that looks like this, which is you have a hand car with a bunch of folks on it. And this is the rail performance model as it is today for most uh, people who make websites. So this is you, um, and then you have a ton of third parties. And those guys are actually super important for you because without them, you don't have a business most of the time. Um, and then finally, there is the second parties, uh, so user and advertisers. And the main issue is that each of those folks actually have different goals. And if you think at what they are doing, everything they are doing is actually very rational. Um, like if you think about what the Networks um, wants to do, they want to make money for the publisher, right? So it can continue to, to create contents and whatnot. Um, but the key issue is that in order to do so, they have to use very scarce resource, and there is no coordination whatsoever. So this is basically what happens, right? Um, you probably see a lot of articles on the web explaining that the performance on mobile web sucks currently, and people are saying that this is all about the ads. And the truth is that it's actually more than that. Uh, it's not only ads and other third parties, but even first party actually have a lot of work to do. So that's basically what happened right now. There is no coordination. Everyone wants a piece of the, the scarce resource. And eventually, something like this happened, right? The user experience just sucks. So let's take a look back at um, the system. And what I've been focusing on is mostly this side of the system, because there are only a finite number of third parties. And if you can work with them, um, understand their needs, and work with them on trying to improve their performance, you can have an impressive reach and fix a lot of issues on the web. Whereas if you were just to focus on the first party, you would have a hard time because there is so many first parties uh, on the web, right? Uh, and the same goes actually for the advertisers. If you just focus on the advertisers by trying to help them make better ads, um, you, you might fix maybe a couple of ads for um, a quarter or so, but then a new set of ads would just come up and so on and so on. So what we did is we actually looked at a bunch of traces from different websites to try to understand what the third parties are doing and what is bad about it and how we can hopefully uh, help them with maybe new API or reaching on explaining I, instead of doing this way, trying to do it this other way, which is better for X, Y, and Z reasons. 
So let's take a look at um, a bunch of things. So starting with the R of Realm, I'm also batching the idleness in that because I think those two actually go together. So this trace, has anyone in the like, idea of what this is? Anyone? So you can kind of guess that, sorry? No, yeah, I wish it would be, because then we could fix it. <laughs> so this is actually an ad made in HTML5. And the, the reason I'm saying I wish it was like Polymer, because if it was Polymer, we could go to that, to that team and have them fix that issue, right? But this is like an HTML5 ad. And what happened is that they are just using um, Adobe Flash Pro, and they are using a framework which is called CreateJS. And I'm not sure what is wrong with this. Is this the ad itself or the framework? It's kind of hard to tell. So if you look at what's happening, you have a timeline that's basically dominated by scripting for the HTML5 ad. Everything is about that particular HTML5 ad. And on top of that, for that particular case, that ad was actually off screen. It was already at the end of the animation for the ad. So if you were to look at what was going on, there was nothing visible on the screen. And yet, it was using a lot of the main thread doing something. Um, yeah. So, and this is. Important because if you were to try to scroll during that time, you would have a bad time. Um, this is, you have the touch start event, touch move, and touch end up above. And if you measure the time it takes to actually get something on the screen to actually scroll, this is what you would see. Um, it's kind of difficult to precisely measure that, but um, it's, it's pretty clear that the response time was very slow, between 300 and 350 milliseconds. So three times what we expect in terms of good user experience. And the reason for that was basically you had animation frame um, running for a long time. And then you had a, a scroll event and a couple of folks who want to know about whenever you scroll the screen. And we explain why. And so that basically means um, this is really bad because not only like, the user does, doesn't understand what's going on, the ad is off screen. Um, Sorry. So that's one example of things that happen in the world. All right. Um, now, if we take a look at animation, um, I think this slide was actually on the main keynote, or maybe something very similar to it. Um, so this is one janky frame. This particular frame took 89 milliseconds. So um, again, what you want to do if you want to hit 60 frames per second, you want to keep that frame within 60.6 uh, milliseconds. So this one was a particular long frame, right? Um, very bad user experience. You can see that there is a lot going on in that particular frame. Um, you have a lot of different third parties and also the first party. They want to know whenever you actually you want to, just, uh, you want to scroll the screen. Um, so you have folks like want to know if you are actually a human, because they want to avoid like, people, people abusing advertisers and so on. Um, this one is a tag manager. So when, when I say tag, it's basically all those third parties, the common name for all of that is tag. So it's basically something that kind of um, handle all the um, integration points and so on. So I'm not exactly sure what it was doing, but it's not important because this one was very cheap, right? Um, then you have more things like the first party was apparently doing something, probably trying to do something fancy with parallax, parallax effects and whatnot. Um, then some more OGS inside. This one is pretty cheap, so that's fine. And then you had add analytics. Um, so this particular third party, what it does is it wants to know if a particular ad is visible on the screen. And the service that this particular third party does is if you go to their website, and you are an advertiser, you can ask, where was my ads shown? And it would come up with a list of websites. And so you would know, oh, my ad was actually shown on The Verge, for instance, or Ars Technica, or whatever. So, and you can see that it took 20 milliseconds just to do that, which is already over the budget. 
And then even more impressive is this one, which is trying to understand what the user is about, what he's doing on your website. And this one, uh, like 41 milliseconds. So this is really bad. And finally, um, this is a third party that measure if the ad was on the screen. This, this particular one is pretty cheap, but it's because we work with them to try to uh, mitigate the issue, uh, despite the fact that we don't yet have like intersection observer. Um, so a lot of work went into that, but it's not perfect yet. It's on this, this particular frame, it's fine, but uh, what happened after the fact sometime can also take some, some uh, amount of uh, time on the main thread. All right. Another example, um, so again, this one is particularly interesting because um, not only the third party are like screening the user experience, but also the first party is doing a lot of work inside one frame. You can see this there. Uh, yeah. Sure. I guess it is, yeah. As far as I can tell, it's kind of difficult because most of the code is actually obfuscated. So it's kind of like mostly guesswork sometimes. Um, so maybe it's partly due to the fact that I'm using a Nexus 4 device, which is not the super high-end device you, you might use. Um, yeah, I'm probably one thing, maybe not on this particular trace, but sometimes what happens is that you have a bunch of ad slots on the same website and you want to know if every one of them is visible on the screen. And instead of doing like this like one check at a time, you would just do everything in one go. So that's also one issue that uh, I'm seeing a lot. Okay. So basically, this particular third party, what it does is Whenever there is a, a scroll event, it will just take note of it and schedule a timer to do the heavy work after the fact. Uh, and so thanks with, um, to, the, to the Blink scheduler, this actually helps because we're trying to avoid like, two firing timers when the user is scrolling. Um, so that kind of helps in terms of the user experience. Any more questions? All right. Um, and then maybe this, this is probably the last example for the animation section. So this one is very interesting because, um, first of all, any idea what's going on there? There is a hint there. This is a video ad, right? What do you think this is doing? This is taking 227 milliseconds. And that's only the first part of it, right? There is something that happened after this. You can maybe tell from the name of the function. You can see VP8, decode frame. What do you think this is doing? Exactly. Um, the reason for that is on Chrome for Android, we decided that autoplay was not a thing. And so people know that um, video advertising really, really works. And so they would find ways to work around that. And so despite the fact that we don't have autoplay, they would just make it work. Um, and you, as you can tell, it's actually pretty heavy. And something you cannot tell from this trace, if you were to look at the network um, activity, it's actually worse for the user because they will download like heavy frames and maybe sometime the whole like 15 seconds of the ad, is, and regardless of actually if you want to see it or not, instead of just streaming the content as it goes like you would if you were actually to use autoplay. So I think the, the moral of this particular trace is that whenever we, whenever we think about you doing user agent interventions, we should think about what could happen, what's the, where the pendulum would swing back, right? Because obviously this is actually a worse user experience than just letting people use autoplay. So we have to be very careful when we decide to make some change like this. All right. And finally, the last part is about loading. So I'm mostly focusing on the time it takes to get something meaningful on the, on the, on the screen, right? The time to first meaningful paint. And the time also it takes to get to a usable state. So this is a website I've kind of 
hidden the name to avoid like shaming. Maybe it's showing somewhere. Uh, yeah, it's actually showing. So anyway, the point is not to shame anyone. Um, this kind of error actually happened a lot. So you can see that this particular website, it took 6.5 seconds to actually get something useful on the screen. And the reason for that is you had like only two first meaningful pain blocking assets. And you can see that this one took a very long time to actually update um, to uh, finish the download. And this is a style sheet. And this style sheet actually contained three fonts which were embedded in the CSS. So traditionally, what you do usually is you just say, this is my font, this is where it leave URL, right? But instead of doing that, this website decided I would just put my fonts in the CSS, right? And what you end up with is a very large style sheet that just blocked rendering for 4.4 seconds. And not only like it contains three web fonts that are actually poorly optimized, those are not like web, web two web fonts, it's just web one web fonts. So 30% 30, 30 bigger than they should be. And it also contains like um, a 26 kilobyte background image. Um, so if instead of doing that, you were to say, this is where my web font lives, we could actually do something much faster than that, right? We could like render something maybe useful on the screen, especially because the font for the main content was actually doing the right thing. It was pointing to a URL version of it, right? But that doesn't make any sense because we still have to wait for the whole style sheet to download for those uh, three additional web fonts that were used for like subtitles and whatnot. So you can see that it's not only about third parties. Sometimes the first party actually have a lot of work to do. All right, another one. Um, the first one above is a conditional get request. And this one is just like three or four. And the one below is like a usual get request that will end up in a 200 response. Which one do you think goes faster? Up, raise your hand, down. Top one. <laughs> All right, obviously the get response takes a lot of time, right? 1.10 seconds. But the conditional get response actually took more time than the get response. And the reason for that is this one went actually before this one, and it had to pay the cost for the DNS lookup, which was very expensive. So what this tells you is that if you have like a very short max age, this will happen a lot, and especially if you are third party because your origin is very specific to your service. And so if you have multiple third parties on your website, you end up paying that cost a lot. Regardless if it's actually on the, on the cache and ready to be used, you will also have like a very poor user experience in terms of loading time. All right, one more. So this is like a whole trace of loading a page. Um, this event right there is the load event, but it really doesn't matter because what we care about is having something useful on the screen, right? And after that, we want to be able to actually use the page. It should be like, you should not have a bad user experience trying to scroll it. And you can see that there is a huge task running right there and when that happens, basically, the user will have a very bad time if, it, if, it, uh, if the user was actually trying to, to scroll this page during that time, right? And what this particular script does is it has a bunch of like, um, different layouts to try for an ad. And then what it does is like, it will just try everything, finding the one that's maximizing the most screen real estate, and finally use that one, right? Um, and you can see it took 2.6 seconds to do that. What this particular third party should do instead is, instead of trying every combination in one go, it should turn, just try one and then yield back to the main thread and then try the other one and so on and so on. And actually you could say, instead of doing that on the client side, maybe the best thing to do would be actually to try to do that on the server side, right? Because then you don't have to pay that cost. All right, 
uh, finally about usability. Um, so suppose you have like um, something useful on the screen. You, you're trying to read the article, right? You end up in this spot, and then suddenly this happened. I don't know if you saw it. Like the layout like just changed. Like you were reading, and now you're lost. You don't know where you were. And the reason for that is there was an ad that showed up above what you were reading. And so maybe I'm missing something, but um, I wish that we could actually be a bit smarter about that and avoid like messing up what's on the screen for something that's off screen. So maybe it's not that easy to do. I'm not sure, but I would love to discuss that particular issue uh, with folks. All right. So you probably wonder now, what do we do about it, right? So I'm not going to explain everything because there is a lot of ongoing things. Uh, hopefully, we have a lot of sessions covering um, all of those different ideas. But if you have questions, I would be happy to answer them. So basically, what we've been doing is like reaching out to folks, mostly third parties, to try to find why are you doing this? And then we learn. We learn, for instance, that they want to do viewable impression, and currently it's too expensive. So we work with them to design the um, intersection of the verbs, Right? And then we also learn that people want to know what the user is doing on, this, on the website so that they can help the publisher like, optimize the content and so on. And so they want to know whenever the user scrolls, but they actually don't want to do about, like, uh, anything about the scrolling behavior. And so we are working with Rick on this new API called Event Listener Options, where basically you can say, um, I want to know when something scrolls, but I don't intend to do prevent default, so just run the, the scrolling um, on the compositor. Um, so there is a lot on that slide. I'm just going to skip that one, because mostly we are probably running out of time. Um, other things we could do also is trying to, within the scope of the spec, trying to shift things around so that we can actually improve the user experience. So a lot of that already happened in the Blink scheduler land. So you could talk to the team and learn more about what they did and what they plan to do uh, next. Um, yeah. The other category of things we are looking into is, what if we decide to throttle what's off screen? Maybe if it's off screen, maybe it doesn't matter that much. So instead of having the ad like we, show, uh, like we saw in the slide, like eating the main thread, despite the fact that it's actually off screen, we could say, if it's off screen, well, maybe it doesn't need to run, right? All right. Um, and then the last section would be um, things that might actually be against the spec, but we might still consider doing them because we think it could be better for the user. So one example of that, which is ongoing uh, right now, is on slow connection, um, so when you use web fonts, right now there is a, a three seconds timeout, after which we decide to fall back to the system font. And looking at the metrics that we have, we found out that on slow connection, actually this happened a lot. So instead of waiting for that to happen, what if instead of like waiting, we just decided to do it from the get-go? So that's one thing we are looking into. All right, and then to close, I would just want to remind everyone about um, the, eco the ecosystem, what's going on. This is the most important slide of the whole presentation. <laughs> so you have a bunch of actors, right? Publishers, ad networks, advertisers, analytics, social, a whole bunch of third parties. They all have their own goals, right? Publishers, they want to delight people with content and fancy user experience. Our networks, they want to help the publisher to thrive and make money. The advertisers, they want to get the user attention with fancy creatives. Analytics, basically, they want to help the publisher understand who their users are. And finally, the social part, and they want to help the publisher to reach its audience, right? All of that means that everyone is using a bunch of resources. Right? They want to use the main thread, they want to use bandwidth, they want to use memory, they want to use battery. And the bad thing about it is that currently there is, there is no coordination between those folks, right? Everyone use whatever they want and get away with it, except that in the end, the user is paying for that. And that, in a sense, is basically a tragedy of the commons. 
So the question I have for the audience, and hopefully we can discuss that during those two days, is what else do we need to fix this fundamental issue with the ecosystem? Because it's fine to have like a bunch of API that should help people do the right thing and hope that they actually chunk their work into like 50 millisecond pieces. But if you think about the dynamics that are behind the system, one could say that actually um, it's in your own interest to not do that, to not chunk your work, because the sooner you can, you can show your ad, for instance, you can display your ad to the user, the better in terms of like fulfilling your particular goal, right? If you want to make money to the publisher, your goal is to put an ad on the screen as fast as possible. And so that basically means that you should get hold of the main thread and use it as much as you want. And so if we just hope that people would do the right thing, um, probably things won't move fast enough. Thanks. We have time for more questions. No. Anyone? So looking at your list of uh, scarce resources, uh, battery, do we have anything to measure this? No, have we made any progress? That's uh, the big question. Um, there is nothing to measure a battery. Um, yeah, memory we kind of have, but maybe it's very difficult to know exactly who is using what sometimes. Uh, bandwidth, this one is pretty easy to tell. Main thread, we already have things, right, in DevTools. Yeah, but battery, I don't know. I don't think we have anything yet. All right. Someone who knows. Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways to measure battery. Uh, this is mostly limited to the waterfall, but we do have end user metrics on uh, how much battery has elapsed when, uh, when you're, you're running on battery per hour. So that, that's what we have for end users. Um, so uh, there's a lot of software metrics for, for battery. And they're different per platform. So on uh, Intel platforms, telemetry has the uh, Intel MSRs. Unfortunately, that doesn't include GPUs. So a lot of uh, our battery goes to GPU, and, and that doesn't work so great. On Android, there's dumpsys power metric, which again, is just, it doesn't include uh, GPU. So uh, we've got a couple things. First, we do have uh, some Android devices have a power gauge built in, like the Nexus 6. So we have uh, telemetry tests that measure battery on the Nexus 6 with the fuel gauge. And we're working on a device called, using a, integrating a device called Bator into tracing and telemetry. That gives, uh, it ties right into the battery, so it's getting like ground truth measurements. It includes Wi-Fi and um, all the GPUs and CPUs and everything like that uses battery. It's about uh, 10 kilohertz frequency, and we can align it right on top of the trace. So you see a big spike in battery usage, and you can scroll down the trace to see what's happening. So first, we're integrating that with tracing. And then when we've got that finished, we're going to integrate it with telemetry. So uh, we have perf tests running on our waterfall. You see a spike in battery usage, and you, look at a, you can look at a trace before and after. Uh, yeah, you'll be able to, to order a device if you're outside of Google, and the Perf Tribots will also have them. There was a question over there. Um, so my question is, since we already have almost working out-of-process iframes implementation, have you experimented with this? I know some people in our Waterloo office have done some benchmark. I don't remember the results, but they showed some promising, interesting results. So um, I just wondered if you see if you've tried it. Yeah. Um, so I think we are looking in some sense because most of the ads are still like within an iframe. So we could we could like solve the, the issue that we saw with this ad like hitting the main thread for no good reasons by putting it in a different process and, and do something like this. Uh, obviously, 
we probably don't want to do that for like each individual iframes, but maybe what we could do is like put all the cross origin iframes separately, and that could be one way to deal with it. Especially, maybe I'm wrong with this particular view, but um, when ads were actually done in Flash, Flash was its own process, so that particular kind of issue was not an issue for people who make the ads, right? They just assume that everything would just work fine, like the, the system will figure it out. But this is not true anymore. And also, last week I was at uh, an event talking to people who actually make the ads, and it's very clear to me that they don't have like the, the background that you would need to understand how to use DevTools. Um, so I'm not sure if like just explaining how to use it would be enough. So probably something like getting back to the to the to the world where basically performance of ads was not that big of a deal is very appealing to me as well. It, it seems that fatty the commons occurs because ad networks, analytics, and social aren't accountable. It, there's no one policing them. Is there a way we can make it much more obvious to the publisher which of the embedded things are, co are costing them performance? Like in DevTools maybe, or? So I, I think in the, is the question about like, how do we tell the publisher what, what's going on? Right. Um, so in the keynote, there was mention about like, we need to work on like closing the feedback loop. And I totally agree that we, we need to tell the publisher that this is going on. Like this third party is actually killing the user experience. And maybe that's good enough for them to shop around, find a better solution, or like get back to the, to the team that works on that product and tell them, you have to fix this. This is not working for us. Because right now, they actually don't know. They just like hear people complaining about it, but there is no evidence whatsoever, right? Hey, I wonder if you could go one step further and actually allow the host site to enforce restrictions on, say, certain domains. Say you can't load for more than this long, or you cancel your load. That way, the incentives are more aligned because the ad never shows, and it like directly hits the money. It's very hard to hear. I don't know if you can hear. Maybe uh, there is no speaker there. <laughs> can, you, can you say again? So I wonder if we could actually uh, enforce this at the, say, URL layer where we just stop loading resources after a certain amount of time and give the publisher the ability to do this. That way, the ad never loads, and it hurts the advertiser directly. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I got that. So, what are we talking about in the putting in the HTTP request uh, budget? I think that's what the question is getting is it Is the question about, like, Telling you, we expect you to fit within this particular budget, right? Um, so, as you, as you saw, most of what's out there is very far from being real compliant. So, my take on that is that we should start from where we are on average. And the expectation is that if this is what the performance is on average, you should be able to fit your, your site or your third party within this particular budget. And then we can take it back very slowly to what we think is good for the user experience. So that's probably one, one thing we could try. Uh, I know you've been speaking to a bunch of Google ad teams with some success. Have you had any success talking to uh, external partners that are the authors of some of these scripts? So my success out there has been kind of limited so far. I had um, good um, like good relationship between web fonts vendors. So on the loading side, like getting those web fonts to show faster, um, I've been working with the three main players, and we, we got a good like interaction, and they are fixing things. So this is working. What's not working, though, is um, talking to the other third parties, like people who do uh, content recommendation, um, the other ad networks. So. But to be fair, I didn't spend too much time yet on that part. I was mostly focusing on web fonts, because this is a space I know a lot, and then working with people inside the company, because it's kind of much easier to, to work with them. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to, buy, to, to work with other folks as well. Uh, are there places where uh, the performance of Blink uh, 
um, or so a, a major rail failure on Blink performs differently in other browsers. I, I'm wondering if there are uh, large deviations when we look at other browsers. Are there pages that perform particularly poorly in Blink that perform okay in other browsers, or is there a lot of variance there? So the tricky thing is that there is no like rail metrics available in other browsers, so you have to measure it manually, which can be tricky sometimes, right? But that being said, when I was looking into the web forms, we did find a couple of things that were, why is this like this? This is a bug. We need to fix that, right? Um, and probably like other browsers don't have the same bugs as well. So it, it's probably true that like different browsers have like different uh, performance uh, characteristics on the same website. I have some. Is this on? Ha. I have something to add about this too. Is it's especially hard, and this applies to PDR's comment as well. It's especially hard to reason about these things because the way ad networks work typically is they'll farm out to some other ad network, which will farm out to some other ad network, and you're like 12 layers deep, and then at the bottom of that stack, there's different advertisers creating different ads. And they can write arbitrary script in their ad. Um, and so what you end up getting is on a given page load of a given publisher's site, so NewYorkTimes.com or whatever, you'll get totally different performance characteristics from the same ad network. So like, it'll load the Google ad network. And on one page load, it'll be totally terrible. On the next page load, it'll be totally fine. Um, I really recommend people try the Ghostery extension. Uh, it has this unique thing as an ad blocker where it has a report only mode. So it just like tells you what was loaded. And it shows you in the bottom right corner the, like, all the different ad networks and trackers. And you can go to a page and like, reload it 10 times. And you'll see like, on one page load, there will be like five ad networks loaded, ad networks and trackers and that whole set of third parties. Uh, on another page load, there will be like, honestly 50. Same site, right? So it's like, very hard to reason about and do like, apples to apples comparisons, even within the same browser. It gets even harder across browsers, which isn't to say we shouldn't do it. It's just it's hard. All right. So actually, uh, less of a question, just building on what was just said earlier. Uh, when I talk to lots of publishers, they they actually don't know what's going on in production. Like they, they can test locally, but that's very different from what's happening. So that observability is completely missing. So for the context of Rail, like we have increasingly better tools in DevTools yep. to measure this stuff, uh, but we don't have good tooling for observing this stuff out in the wild. Even basic things like how much bandwidth that I consume or how, much, how many hosts, how many resources that I fetch is kind of a hard thing to, uh, to figure out. So as we work on this, um, I think we've done really good progress in the last year in terms of dev tools. Uh, but as we work and look forward, I think we need to give developers um, yeah. or the publishers better tools to observe what's happening on their sites as when they're deployed. Yeah, definitely. Because each page load has different like performance characteristics, like right. what John said. So the only way to know what's going on is to have like this reporting mechanism in the wild. Right. And this goes back to uh, Dimitri's earlier points yep. about uh, Use real user measurements and enabling that. So as if you're working in this area, for example, battery, like what was just said earlier is like amazing, but I have no idea how or if you guys have thought about exposing that to developers. And that would be an interesting discussion to have. Yeah. All of the traits that I've been showing are like manual stuff. Whenever I see something wrong, I would just plug my device in my computer and take a trace, right, to understand what's going on. But it really doesn't scale, so we need something. Kenji does not scale. It's the <laughs> we can try to stretch him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.